All right, Philippians chapter 4. Um, Paul here at the beginning of it is encouraging the saints to faithfulness, to unity, to peace in the Lord. It, it's a, a theme that threads through this book. There's no apparent disruption like you have at Corinth. The issues they're facing are not as bad as those that we read about in the book of Galatians. But there are things that are stressing and straining the saints here at Philippi. And so he's giving them some admonitions about don't let that tear you apart, destroy you, keep the faith, keep going, uh, so that they don't get off track. Let's begin with Philippians 4, verses 1 through 9. Ron. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Euodia, and I implore Syntyche, to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Two more. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Okay, very good. Uh, verse 1 really is a good transition between chapter 3 and chapter 4. In fact, you may have, if you have a paragraph layout in your Bible, it may actually tack it on to the end of chapter 3. But what was the issue that he brought up in chapter 3 that he dealt with pretty extensively? Our citizenship as in heaven. Okay, our citizenship in heaven as opposed to what? There's, there's something on the other side of that. He's making a comparison there. Our citizenship's in heaven. Who, who are these other people that he's been talking about? Verse 18. For many that, as he describes there, um, that he has warned us about and that he identifies with weeping and sadness they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Exactly. Of Christ. Yeah, here, here are these people that are in the church that are promoting and teaching and practicing false doctrine and early in the chapter he identifies that as a circumcision and he comes down here at the end and gives that warning again about these enemies but he reminds them keep keep your focus your citizenship is in heaven you're waiting on the Lord and that's the way that we go forward that's the way we push through these difficulties these challenges the controversies that we face and so kind of rounding that out in chapter 4 verse 1 he addresses him again as his beloved and longed for brethren joy and crown stand fast so don't let that pressure get to you remain firmly rooted in the Lord and in his truth uh, question number one I'd ask what does Paul mean the Philippians were his joy and crown he's expressing his love for the church in Philippi and he is setting them at what we would consider to be esteemed at a very high level. You know, the things that we find joy and happiness in, the things that crowning 
is a recognition of a level of, of what, high position. Mm -hmm. And earlier in the book, chapter one in particular, what was he concerned about? Or chapter 2, verse 16 in particular. Tells, tells them, hold fast to that word of life, because if they don't, what's going to happen? His labor would be in vain. Yeah, his labor would be in vain. So here he's pointing out, look, you're, you're my joy and crown. It's, it's like on the day of judgment, if they stand fast, that would be kind of like a crown he can wear on that day of judgment. You are my joy and my crown. I, you know, you are something that brings me great joy, satisfaction, as I see you being faithful in the Lord. Don't rob me of that. Don't take that away from me. So he wants them again, he's urging them again to, to make sure they stand fast. Any other thoughts there? So now he's exhorting them very specifically a couple of individuals in the congregation, this Yodia and Syntyche. And if there's another way to pronounce those, please let me know. But who are these two individuals? When you read those names, do you get a sense of who they may be? Well, he goes on to say they're women. Okay. They were actively involved in the work that was going on. What? Why do you think he would put their specific names in here? Why? Why are individuals named in the New Testament? Because there's a lot of people that are not named. Well, I think in some of some of the cases, it has to do with the influence and the um, effort they put into the work with, with different people that were there. Right. Th these are prominent women in the congregation who have worked diligently in the Lord. Yes, sir? I was going to say, just the, the fact that they would be familiar to the other readers, the those that know this congregation would understand who these people were. Right. Do you think Paul's writing anything that the people who are there already don't know that there's this issue between these two women? Now, what is the issue between the two women? We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Okay, it could be personal. There, there could have been some doctrinal friction even off of what he's just said. We, we don't know for sure, but whatever it is, there is friction here and he's saying, you guys need to patch this up. You, you need to get things straight here. Mike? Well, I think it also shows in the first century, Christians had problems also. And they're nothing unique. And, um, you know, it, that could be any, any one of our names also if we had the same problem. With that. Right, exactly right. And Paul is bringing this to their attention and addressing them individually. And everybody, of course... <laughs> When they receive this letter, they're going to get together, they're going to read it as a congregation, and boom, here he is, like, okay, Yodia and Syntyche, you, you need to be of the same mind, okay? Come together on this. Put, put those differences, whatever they are, you, you need to fix that and, and move on. But then in verse 3, he also says, you know, true companion. Now, the expositor's Greek Testament says that this, and I can't, I'm not sure I can pronounce this word, scissorgus? Uh, that this is probably a proper name. But it's one of those names that has a meaning, and so that's why we generally have it translated as the meaning of that name, and it literally is a joiner together. You know, what was, uh, what was the nickname given to uh, Joseph, right? Memory serves me. We know him by a different name. Say it again. Barnabas. Barnabas. What, what's that name? Son of Encouragement, right? So there are names 
that they had that carried a meaning. Generally, when we say our names, we don't think of the meaning of our names. Although almost all of our names have some kind of meaning behind them. Yeah, but some do have nicknames based upon their personality or something. Right. Exactly right. So here's this one who's known evidently, whether it's the given name or it's a nickname, that he is a joiner together. He, he's able to work with people. And, you know, there's people like that in congregations. There's people like that in business. They're, they just have a way of being able to bring people together and to work on people's, you know, difficulties, those friction points. And here he is in this congregation. He says, you know, get with them and help them out. Help them with this difficulty. Because this obviously has the potential, if it's not patched up, to bring a real split in this congregation. There's probably people who are closer to one or the other. And so Paul is bringing this out. Fix this. Get this done so that all of you remain united and working together in the truth. Um, any other thoughts there? Stephen, the, the, the conflict is not made known to us. We suppose that it matters, but Paul doesn't concentrate on that. Instead, he, he tells them that they are to agree in the Lord. That, you know, the, the whole book so far, he's talked about the unity that we're to have in the, in the gospel. Well, that's the common denominator, the thing they have in common that they can agree on and it would help them through this. And that's a, a powerful message for us today. We need to set our personal conflicts aside. We need to, if we study the Scriptures, get into Scriptures, we're going to agree because the Scriptures are true. And we're going to believe the truth. But the, the other stuff needs to be peeled away and set to the side so we can have that unity and peace that, that Paul says this congregation has. Right. Nancy. Well, I was just going to say, Paul doesn't say one is right and the other is wrong. It could have been a scruple. It, it could it could have been anything. All he's saying is, you have to stop it. You have to stop it. Right. And that would be a scary thing to have a letter from Paul naming you. Right. <laughs> saying, you have to stop this. No doubt. No doubt about it. Um, and this, this could be, and again, this is just speculation, but this could be, they both have taken a stand against this false doctrine of the circumcision, but they have different ways of going about it. And that's kind of rubbed them the wrong way. You know, I've seen that among brethren. They, they stand doctrinally in the same place, but they take different ways of approaching it, of combating it, and that can cause a friction sometimes. So... Yes, they need to patch this up, be of the same mind in the Lord, whatever those differences. And, and Paul is, this is not a case of um, like the enemies of the cross that he's mentioned before. So I don't believe it's a, uh, a real doctrinal difference between them. Whatever it is, it's some type of friction that can be worked out. They can stand together in the Lord and help that congregation to be united. Now, the other thing that I want to, to note here is it talks about these women who labored with me in the gospel. What would be our understanding of that? Because the, the denominational world around us would have a different understanding, but what would be the proper understanding here? What are they not? They're not preachers in the local church. Elders, deacons. They're not elders, deacons. The assigned positions that we have that are definitely not women. Right, right. Where, where do we read about other women who are prominent workers in the gospel, but they don't take on that role, say, of like a Timothy or a Philip? Priscilla. Priscilla. She and her husband working together, teaching the gospel. And these women could have been very active in that, teaching people, you know, personal one-on-one -on -one studies. Anything else? Timothy's grandmother Lois and Eunice. Lois and Eunice, right? They passed that truth on to Timothy. Uh, Dorcas, who was known for uh, seeing to the physical needs of those around her. Yes, exactly. She, she was one who 
through her actions, provided that glue, if you will, that held the, especially the widows together and made them feel valued in that community. So exactly right. You've got Lydia who opened her home to Paul and Silas and kept them while they were there at Philippi. You've got Phoebe in Romans chapter 16. Uh, go all the way back to Mary Magdalene and, and she's at the grave and she runs and tells the apostles it's empty. And so there are a lot of women that are noted in the New Testament who labored in the gospel, helped the cause of Christ, helped to advance that, but within the bounds of what God has set down within the roles of men and women within his church. So next thing he mentions there in verse 3 is whose names are written in the book of life. What is the book of life? Anybody remember? Revelation letter is also referred to as the book of life, which is, and the book will be opened, and the names that are recorded therein is the book of life. So, to me, when I read this, I was thinking that God has given Paul insight into the status of the saints that he is referencing, mm -hmm. that their names are recorded in the book of life. And I was thinking about that in regards to what you were saying. Stephen, too. If this was a doctrinal matter, he wouldn't be saying that. Mm -hmm. So this hasn't compromised their salvation, but it's a conflict that apparently ultimately could, if if that is a correct thought. Right. John? Well, it's the book, book that contains the names of those that can expect to spend eternity with Christ and God. It's separate apart from the books that contain a list of our deeds. And that, because there's books that are going to be opened at the end, and, and the, the book of deeds, if you, if, if you mm -hmm. call it that, is a list of what we've done where the book of life contains the names of those that are going to be in heaven. Right. In ancient times, they very often in, in the cities and stuff, they would keep a roll of the living. They would keep a census. And this is where that idea really springs from, is these are the people who belong here. He just mentioned citizenship in heaven. This is a role of those who have that citizenship in heaven. So he's saying their names are written in the book of life. And that's where, of course, we want our names to be written. So he tells them then in verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Um, the only true place of rejoicing is in the Lord. Outside the Lord... There, there is room for sadness, sorrow, guilt, pain, suffering, but in the Lord is where we can rejoice, even in the midst of what? Trials, difficulties. They're going through some trials and difficulties here. They're facing some tensions, and those things can be frustrating. Even if they're not open and major splits, those underlying tensions, those currents going through can, can wear people down. And he's reminding them, rejoice in the Lord. You have great blessings in Him. Let your gentleness, gentleness be known to all. Um, what's another way to describe gentleness? Maybe you even have a different word translated there. Graciousness. Graciousness? Reasonableness. Reasonableness, right? Can people become unreasonable in times of tension? Okay, yes, yes, we can do that. We can become unreasonable. They need to have some forbearance as they go through this. He mentions that the Lord is at hand. Uh, there are some who see that as the Lord's at hand, as Paul was saying he could return at any minute, and that's true. Uh, there are others who lean toward, and I would lean toward. He's talking about the Lord is here. He's observing. He's among you. He knows what's going on. And so you need to make sure that your attitude, your actions are correct. All right, so verses 6 and 7, question number 2, what things do we get anxious about, or maybe more properly, about what things do we get anxious? Okay, everything. I love those generic, everything. All right, specifically. Coronavirus. Okay, yeah. It, it, stress, it has stressed some people like they've never been stressed in their life. 
It has completely taken them into a new area in their life, their emotions. Finances, right? I'm not sure I've ever known anyone who's never, never worried about their finances. What else? Our freedoms. Freedoms. We're very, there's a very broad concern about freedoms right now. Rick, do you have something? What else, Ron? Conflict and distress within the Lord's church. Maybe because over concerns of the coronavirus, right? I mean, we've, this, I couldn't tell you how many different things I've heard from many different places about stresses that it's brought on congregations. I just have to commend this congregation. We have some, you know, different views about things, but we've not succumbed to the bitterness, the factionalism, the attacking one another. We've had discussions, but we've not, thankfully, fallen into what others have. So you, this congregation, the members here, are definitely to be commended for not having gone down that route. So there are things that we get anxious about um, that can really eat away at us and end up consuming our minds to the point we're not focused on the things we need to be focused on. And when we get consumed about those things, that's when there's a door open for Satan to come in and to destroy us. You know, the Lord talked about in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, be anxious for, uh, don't be anxious for these things of the world, right? Don't worry about your food, your clothing, your shelter. God takes care of the birds. God takes care of the flowers. Look at the lilies of the field. Look at those things and see that God provides. Because if we become overly focused on it, how did he begin that discussion? Do you remember? Okay, he wound it up with seek first the kingdom of God. And before that, he talked about verses 19 to 21, where your treasure is, what? There your heart will be also. And he said you can't serve God and mammon. If you're obsessed about those things, now whether it's material things or it's your safety or it could be your children even that you become obsessed about, then that, that's where your focus, your energy, your effort is going to be and it can be miserable. As opposed to well, let me ask you this first. Question three, how does he tell us to deal with anxiety? Okay, we rejoice. Prayer is, is a primary, fundamental thing to use when you have anxiety. Exactly. What does prayer do for us? So much. Mm -hmm. Everything from it, it allows you to let things out that are building up and stressing. So you're able to uh, vocalize that and get those thoughts out. Whereas if you don't stop and pray about things like this, you're going to end up building up and being more tense, having more tense. All right. Mike, you have some makes us admit that we can't handle this ourselves mm -hmm. and that we are dependent mm -hmm. on God. And so, you know, a person with a good prayer line um, is in a constant state of that admittance. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know you're here with me, and that's kind of what he's saying here, you know, that you know, God's right there. So, um, but, you know, I know that I, I, I need work on my prayer, and I'm sure all of us can probably admit that we all need that. But that's where what it pulls down for me is it makes me admit that I don't have control of what's going on. Even though I may think it's in control, it is not in control for me. But I can hand it over to God and know that even when it's out of control, God still in control. Of it. Yeah, it it is a manifest admission. We depend on God. <laughs> it's not in my power. Uh, prayer provides hope and comfort to us. When you uh, um, 
turn over those problems to the creator of the universe. What power source is limited to you? He can do anything he wants about the situation. And so it, it provides comfort in that regard and hope because you're not going through this alone. Even though you may have other people involved in it, um, their limitations are your limitations mm -hmm. to some extent. Not entirely, but to some extent. So it, it, anything we can handle with prayer gives us hope and comfort. Yes. And that would be anything. Ron? See, when I think about anxiety and fear and the effects on it, it is that which becomes debilitating. And we are we're recognizing the effects of war and that the enemy wants to create fear. I mean, this was what the Germans did extensively, but we realized that was sent with Satan. If he can debilitate us, then we stagnate. We don't grow, we don't press on, we don't charge forward, we don't continue to advance ourselves against the oppositions that we face in this life. Okay. And I do want to make a point on that. That Paul is not saying you don't have concerns, you don't take reasonable precautions in life, you don't take actions on things that you see as potentially dangerous, things like that. I mean, after all, in Ephesus, there was the riot in Ephesus, and he wanted to go into the theater, but the brethren were like, not a good idea, Paul. We're not letting you go in. And that wasn't a case of a lack of faith. That was like, it's not good judgment. And there are different things you can read about through the Bible like, okay, th there's a matter of judgment in some of these things. And so he's not saying just dismiss all danger, all issues, all problems, you know, just kind of being oblivious. That's, but like what Ron's saying, these are things that can get to that point of debilitating us. We get too focused on it. It destroys our relationship with God and our activity in the kingdom. Everything from just worshiping God to serving, teaching, getting out, doing things in the kingdom. So he's saying don't let that happen. It can rob you of the time in prayer. It can rob you of your Bible study. So make sure you go to God cast those cares upon him because he cares for you as Peter writes about and he talks about here to not be anxious in anything but in everything by prayer and supplication let your request be made known to God of course with the thanksgiving wrapped up in it what's the result of it verse 7 God reminded the guard Okay. The comfort that Nancy mentioned a moment ago. So this peace that comes. This how does this peace of God surpass all understanding? We don't know how it works, but it happens. We don't entirely know how it is that we feel comforted in that, but we do. Right. Can't can't explain or fully grasp it. If you take the human mind and you try to rationally reason that out, um, I mean, why would getting on your knees or, or taking time to pray, which is essentially, and I'm going to take it that this is like personally, privately, you're speaking in your mind, maybe you're speaking out loud when you pray, but you're by yourself. Why would that have any impact whatsoever on your situation in life? But it does. You have this peace, you have this comfort, you have this calmness that we were talking about. And so this peace that passes understanding, he says, guard your hearts and minds. Again, the expositor's Greek Testament says that, that guard your hearts and minds here. This is the terminology used for garrison, like a military garrison. And Thayer's says this is to guard protect by military guard. So, when you think about that, what's it saying here? Is it, is it saying that you have fortified, you have, you have put your 
um, your heart, your determination in this life in a, in, a, in a fortified situation where outward things are not going to be able to break in and break down your faith. Okay, yes. Yes to that, Ron? It's protecting us from the wrong form of thinking. He, again, is giving us a, a comparative. You know, if you're anxious, these are the things that happen to you. But if you are free from that anxiety, then you're able to do the things that the Word of God frees you to do. We have that liberty in Christ because we're freed from the things that mentally will disrupt us. Okay, okay. Uh, two, two things. Who in here likes to be anxious, worried, just tense all the time? I don't. I like peace, so that, that should help us. Okay, I like peace, so uh, here's, here's a way to find that peace. In spite of what may be going on in life, I can actually be relaxed about it because I've gone to God in prayer about it. But this peace of God provides the protection. I think about it. At least to me, maybe I'm the only one. We're talking about we have a military garrison that's established by God that protects us, guards our hearts and minds because we go to Him in prayer. We go to Him with our troubles, with our anxieties. And that gives us that, it's divine protection. It's kind of like what Paul wrote about in Ephesians 6. You, you have this armor of God that's there to protect you and to help you. This is another way of describing, here's how God helps you in life to get through those problems, those things that concern you. Go to Him in prayer. Ron, do you have something else? But as you're describing, it's an inside job, isn't it? We have to work from inside ourselves about these things. And if we're doing as he says here and you've expressed, if we pray about everything, you know, we prevent the small things from becoming big things that overtake us. Mm -hmm. and, and we don't wait until we're faced with a calamity before we begin to address it, which is the whole story of the children of Israel. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Like. He's also not saying, you know, Linda and I were just whisper about. Um, he's not saying that these things will not come along. No. Hard times are going to come. I mean, you know, the Christians that, you know, faced, um, faced the, uh, gladiators and everything else that came along, you know, they just make sport of them. Mm -hmm. But yet, with this, there was still peace that they could find in all of that, that this is part of God's plan. And I'm part of it. And, you know, whatever role that I'm, that I'm supposed to play. Okay. When we read in the Gospel accounts, Jesus went from the upper room with His disciples over to the garden. What is... What, how would you describe the emotional state of Jesus when He's in the garden and He's praying? It says he's in terror. Terror. Okay? When the Romans and the Jews show up to arrest him, how would you describe his emotional state? Calm and reason. Complete self -control. Full. Complete self-control. So to your point, and what we've been talking about, you know, Jesus had always been in the habit of praying to the Father. And here's the biggest challenge of His life here on earth. And He goes to the Father in prayer and He's able to calmly face it then. That's the same with us. We have to be in this habit of prayer. And when those big things come along, we, we need it will be there. We will have exercised that spiritual muscle, so to speak, to where it's just going to be natural, it's going to be more useful to us, and it, it will help us. So, another point, we have to take time to pray. You know, if our life is consumed with all these things that take up our time, and we don't stop to pray, we're, we're going to have a hard time doing this. John? We need to understand, he's fairly specific on how to do this. 
One, we're thankful. So in our prayers, we need to thank God. So all the many list of things that we need to be thankful for, but we also need to be to have supplication, which is to ask, to petition God for things. And th those are two things that, that we need to be in the habit of doing while we're praying, because that's the answer to the, to the question. He says, put your anxieties to the side. Don't be anxious. Be thankful. Uh, ask God, petition God for help, and He will help you. But those, those are two things that we... We need to put in practice in our, in our prayer life. If we're not doing those, we're not going to be able to uh, set our anxieties to the side. Right. Exactly right. Chris? If we do, as God tells us to, to pray without ceasing, which is daily, spending our time in prayer whenever we can, whether we're driving a car or maybe you're praying about things at work or while you're at work or at home or wherever you are, then that builds what you need, it builds the comfort, it, it gives you the belief, your faith, knowing that every time we pray, that God Almighty is going to take care of every situation. You're doing what you're supposed to be doing at that point, laying your past cares and problems on Him as we, as Christians, are required to do so. Right. And sometimes God's answer is no. Let this cup pass for me. His answer was no. That's not how this is going to happen. So sometimes it's no, sometimes not this way, sometimes not right now. But we have to have that faith that God is always doing what is best for us. Always. And sometimes that means going through some very difficult things, but that refines us, it purifies us, it strengthens us, if we'll keep our focus on Him, if we don't keep our focus on Him, it'll tear us apart, it'll destroy us, it'll take us down. Chris? Well, we know that uh, God's Word is true. He does answer prayer. He answers it in His own way, in His own time. Okay, um, to that point, and I, I think we're going to probably save the second half for next week, considering where we are, but... Um, <laughs> How many of you can reflect back on your life and there was something that was major you were concerned about, you took it to God in prayer, time passed by, you didn't realize how it was going to be solved, you didn't, and then all of a sudden the solution comes along. That door is open. The problem is, is resolved. But you, you couldn't... I know this happened to me a few times. I couldn't connect A to B to C. It just happened. Things I was concerned about worked out. I'm not saying it happens that way every time. Because we're going to see here verses 8, eight and 9. This, he's telling us we've got to do our part too. We, we pray, but there's other things you need to keep in mind here. Literally. <coughs> Any other thoughts before we go to eight and nine. All right, question four. I asked you to list three things that fit and three things do not fit what Paul describes. So as he's talking about these things, whatever things are true and noble and just and pure and lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's anything, any virtue, anything praiseworthy. So what are some things that fit within those? First and foremost, the Word of God. Word of God. I mean, that's the first thing that pops in. Right. You, you want to have your mind on these things? There is no better source to go to fill your mind than the Word of God. Anything else? We can look for the good in situations and not focus on the negative. Okay, look for the good purposely look for that. That's a challenge for me, I'll admit. <laughs> Anything else? How about prayer? How about hymns? We have hymns, right? You take out the hymn book. You could listen to the quartets or um, I guess it's 
choir, technically, like Florida College Choir. They've got CDs out, I think. So you could, you could listen to that. That would help you to put your mind where it needs to be, to meditate on these things. What else? God has given us many things to help us through this life. He's given us marriage. He's given us the family. He's given us the church. He's given us His Word. But we need to take all those tools that He's supplied to us and as Ashley said, think positively, but use those, those aids that He's given us to, to make it to heaven. Use those things to, as, a, as a help. Does worship and Bible class fall within this? Absolutely. To help us... You know, there's a reason he tells us to assemble regularly. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 3, he says, exhort one another daily. So we have one another to help our minds be filled with these things. Time with the saints. Uh, we can look at the creation, like our lesson last week. I mean, you go take a hike in nature, it can help you to reorient and to think on things that are good to see the great amazing beauty and creation of God. He says to meditate on these. What does it mean to meditate? Okay, we, what, when you think of meditation in our society, what do we think of? No. <laughs> right? It's some weird Eastern religion stuff, right? This was here way before. Meditate. What, what's the idea of meditate? Dwell on. To dwell on. Deep thoughts. Yes, deep thoughts. To, to not just, not, you know, this, this is where I get to, I think it's good to read through the Bible, to read through the Bible in a year, to get a good overview of it and all that, but you can't really meditate in doing that. But if you take a verse or a couple of verses or a paragraph, and you, do, you read that multiple times, maybe in multiple translations, maybe multiple times through the day, and you sit there and you really dwell on it, and you write your thoughts down about it as you go through it, that's turning it over in your mind, looking at it, letting it soak in, if you will. Stephen, meditation is to the mind what digestion and assimilation is to the body. Mm -hmm. And when you take things in your body, you don't immediately benefit from it, do you, other than the satisfaction of eating it, but it's that process. So as you're saying, it's deep reflection upon these thoughts and allowing them to expand and develop within your mind. And that is only accomplished through meditation, not just simply passing them through your thought process. Right. Right, exactly, Mike. Yeah, we have to understand, whenever we're reading scriptures, we're getting just a small portion of the mind of God. And our finite minds, it takes time to absorb just a small little portion. And so, you know, we have to kind of take it in and as Ron put it, we have to digest it a little bit, let it marinate and you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, our brains can kind of take time to really put it into practical application of how am I going to use this in my everyday life. Right. So if we are thinking on things that are true, noble, just, <coughs> lovely, all these things, and we meditate on them, what room is there for anxiety? Right? We're spending time in prayer before God and we're letting these things fill our mind. Then the anxiety gets pushed out. There's no, there's no room for it to get in. It's not saying we're not aware of issues or problems in life. Yeah, we're aware of those, but we're able to process them. We're able to deal with them in the right way and have that peace that passes understanding. So what are some things that don't fit into this? What are some things that undermine thinking on things that are true and noble and just and pure and lovely? The one thing we're told is the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. And that mm -hmm. wrath can lead us into all forms of ungodliness and thinking and, as we know, a, a total preoccupation of your thoughts, particularly if it starts leading you into being vindictive. Yes. Yes, any other thoughts there? Well, you know, you, you mentioned, like, um, the music that we listen to. You know, that, I mean, there's a reason that God chose music for us to teach to one another. I mean... And that's because it has a huge influence upon our mood, upon our outlook.
outlook upon just on the world in general. I mean, so you need to be careful about what you're putting into your ears and your eyes. You know, we talk about the internet and everything else also that kind of comes along with that. And just regular television as well as the internet. Uh, of course, all that has exploded, it seems like. But yeah, the, what are we watching? What are we listening to? What is it that we're taking in? Because it does influence us. It, it gets into our minds. It shapes our attitudes and outlooks and even desires. And so these things will undermine that crude company, crude language that we expose ourselves to in entertainment or otherwise. Uh, social media very often fits into this, okay? So it's not outright immoral, ungodly, unrighteous, but you spend forever. Okay? I have to admit, I spend too much time. You know? Uh-oh. Well, what good is that? You know, people are, they just nothingness out there nothingness. It's like if you were just eating cotton candy all day. Just So, we have to set these things aside, put our minds on what he's saying here, fill our mind with that, and we will have that strength. So, question number five, just real quick, to close it out, reflecting on your life, are you meditating on these things or on other things? You know, that's more of a personal question. Where are you? Do a little self-check. Am I where I need to be? And then he tells them to follow his righteous example. Um, Paul set an example for others. He, was, he lived in a way that he said, hey, the things you, you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. So the question is, could you tell others, hey, the things that you've seen me do, you need to do as well. If we can't confidently say that, we need some work. We need to do some changing in our lives. And then he closes that out saying, you do these things, the God of peace will be with you. So re-emphasizing that idea, the God of peace who provides the peace of God can be with you. He kind of bookends that, if you will, talking about the prayer, where your mind needs to be, what you need to fill it with. God will be with you. Any other thoughts? All right. Lord willing, we'll pick up in verse 10 next week. We'll wrap up our Philippian study um, next week and then in April go on to Colossians.